<laughs> okay, well, just really briefly, I just want to say welcome and, uh, uh, you know, we've had two month hiatus and I think we're back on track. And also an advertisement, if you do have a journal or would like to help present a journal club, please let Chris or I know and uh, we can get you on the schedule. So I'll just turn it over to Chris. <clears throat> <laughs> to me or to Mark? Uh, however you guys want to do it. Okay. Well, yeah, I've, uh, we asked Mark to present tonight. Uh, he's going to be talking about, uh, well, maybe, hopefully, briefly, a uh, paper he published through um, the Society, co-written with, with Ray, but I think the majority of it is going to be more recent research that he's done to build on top of that. So we've, uh, we're, we're happy to have Mark, a uh, long, long time member, uh, speak to us tonight about um, his journal paper and his more recent research, a little, little deviation of a, the, normal, uh, the normal format, but we're happy uh, to make this happen. So you're on, Mark. Okay. Well, hey, everybody. First, I'd like to thank you for being a part of all this. Okay, what I'm going to do today is compare star lore and ceremonial timing in the American Southwest with Mesoamerica. Uh, those that of you at the last conference probably saw a lot of this. I will go over it again. There's a few new things. Um, almost all the images presented today are original, so if anybody would like to use them for their own papers, please, please feel free. Okay, this is not jumping here. Look over here. There it goes. Oh, I saw. Okay, for those of you wanting to study Pueblo ceremonial timing, these are my most referenced books Stephen, Fuchs, Velarde, and Parsons. Okay, uh, this is not switching. How come? <laughs> For Mesoamerica, the most referenced books are Milbreth, Duran, Kroger, and Granzera, and the Florentine Codex. This map shows ancestral homelands and current pueblos. Despite language variances, there's a great deal of shared star lore in the pueblos, which in turn is ties to Mesoamerica. Let me draw your attention to the Mogollon area at the bottom left. There's limited evidence showing interactions between the ancestral pueblo and the Mogollon. However, the Mogollon were influenced by Mesoamerica, so in a roundabout way, one can expect shared trace with the Pueblos. I'm going to start out showing a number of Southwest images overlaid on asterisms. Some we'll see later, others are included as multiple images in one cave show intentionality. Here's a Membrace Mogollon bowl overlaid on Boatis. Membrace bowl with figure overlaid on Cygnus. Sagittarius, painted cave image overlay, slightly altered and overlaid on Iridanus. Mortendad cave, Turkey overlaid on Capricorn and Microscopia. Now this one's of interest as Hamas and Taos plant turkey feathers on November 2nd, All Souls Day when Capricorn is in Lower Meridian. Well, I should mention that um, Rick is the one that did these overlays, by the way. Here's the Morton Dead Cave figure overlaid on Orion. Morton Dead Cave snake image overlaid on Scorpius. Rick was the one that noticed this alignment. Now the Morton Dead Sun God compares to the Aztec Sun God with a Sui Kotol or fire snake in his hand. The Aztec Sun God is celebrated in the 15th month where on the first day of the month the sun rises next to Serpent's God and Scorpio with either possibilities for the snake. Membrace mountain lion image overlaid on Pegasus. Now, most mountain lion images have a tail that arches over the back, and in some, the tail ends in a circle, which would fit on Pisces circlet. Some of you may recall Robert Dragon and Robert and Ann Owen from Silver City. In case you do not know, I'm sorry to say they have both passed on. Before Robert stopped emailing, he sent me a photo of some rock art that he thought was a mountain lion eating and eliminating the sun, which he thought represented an eclipse. I've misplaced the photo on the lower left is my rough drawing of what it looked like. The right image shows the sun rising on 1076 AD total eclipse, 
Notice that it is at Pegasus Pisces. Of interest is the Aztecs also associated a mountain lion with eclipses. Here's the membrace turtle altered somewhat to fit on Origa. Lower left is Tiwa San painting image that was located at the rare book section in Zimmerman Library at UNM. Notice the three dots, possibly tied to the three stones on Maya turtles back in the lower right image. In the Southwest, there are two brothers considered opposites associated with seasons and each tied to opposite ends of the Milky Way or just crossed by the ecliptic. In the East, they are Buffalo and the West War Brothers. Due to different names and different tribes, natives can refer to them simply as humpbacks. They can often be confused with Cocopelli, but in fact, there are two. Here's some, here are some examples of two humpbacks, upper image from Mesa Verde, middle image from Zuni, lower image from T.Y. at Martin Dead Cave. Here's a Hopi mural showing two humpbacks with corn on either waist or neck, which may compare to star clusters or double stars on waist and neck of the asterisms shown by the blue circles. The left one is M13. Here's another mural, Hopi, or rather slightly altered and overlaid on Perseus and Cassiopeia. Rock art from Sly Slifer's Cocopelli book overlaid on Perseus. Membrace bowl image overlaid on Hercules and Aquila. Notice the burden basket fits on Orpheucus. Membrace image compared to Aquila and Hercules. Upper left is the membrace bowl that De Paso suggests is tied to Quetzalcoatl. Upper right membrace bowl that Brody suggests is a warrior twin due to hat. Notice comparisons to Quetzalcoatl and lower image, rounded back, bent leg, snake as well. Pointed how will compare to the following images. Here we have several images showing a triangular head. Upper images are Pueblo, Brothers. Lower left is Zuni, War Totem. Lower right is Rock Art. I always, always thought these images make a good chapter in a book. The Gorman painting is of his grandmother teaching him stars. If you look past the images, the actual stars in the background are of a humpback in Cygnus. You can see him there. Let me switch back. Here's the head. Here's the body. Here's the legs. I once asked Gorman if he had done any other paintings of actual constellations, and he said, no, this was the only one. Now we look at similarities in Pueblo and Mesoamerican events with focus on the Hopi and Aztec ceremonies. The Hopi and Aztec have ceremonies which can go on for days, have some extended ceremonies every four years. Some ceremonial timing is based in part on the moon and in part on stars. And underworld ceremonies can be opposite upper world ceremonies. Now let's take a look at similarities in individual events and gods. But the Hopi new fire is a yearly event held at the start of a Wucham with the Aztec new fire cycles are 52 years. Both events call for putting out old fires before lighting new ones, and in both Pleiades figures prominently. Both the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 and the Maya Revolt of 1546 were time for a full moon with humpback at zenith. The one was at sunrise and the other at midnight. We'll see a similar location in other ceremonies. Also notice how close the moon is for the Maya revolt. Both Hopi and Aztec death gods are associated with the underworld, a house for the dead, skeletons, and burial positions, with the latter also similar to membranes. Hopi and Aztec flute or flute player ceremonies show ceremonial correlations. First, we'll look at the Hopi. There are four recorded historical flute events, three at Hopi and one at Hamas. The Hopi have upper world events and lower world events, which are opposite and generally six months apart. Due to a changing sunrise time, the August-January fluid events are only five months apart. The diagrams at the top show the Cassiopeia Perseus Pleiades complex at sunrise for both upper and lower world events. The image at the bottom is taken from a tile on the Hopi flute altar, which shows similar similarities to the asterism. Now, as a side note, you may recall that McCluskey only used one flute ceremony in his analysis. It would be of interest to see if the underworld ceremonies align with his work. 
With the Hopi having upper and lower world events, it is significantly lowers the set of potential stars associated with the ceremony. And in the case of the flute, makes it possible to identify an asterism using a Venn diagram approach. For instance, if we assume horizon and meridian positions, the diagram would represent available asterisms for an upper world ceremony. We can eliminate northern horizon stars as due to the tilt of the earth when they travel 180 degrees there in the sky and cannot be counted as underworld stars. Circumpolar stars can also be eliminated from the set, which leaves us with approximately 11 constellations to choose from, which we'll call set A. The Hamas had a sunset flute ceremony where Hopi cloth was used on the standard. The set of stars available for it we'll call set B. If we overlay set A on set B, they intersect at the flute asterism. Now let's switch to the Aztec flute player Tezcatl Lapoca. This is the Aztec calendar. Ceremonies on the far right are for Tezcatl Lapoca and his appellations. The purpose of Festival 5 is for rain, which is similar to the purpose for Hopi flute, and the timing for number 9 is similar to Hopi flute timing. This is the asterism location for the main Tezcatl Lapoca ceremony at noon sacrifice. Notice how close Pleiades is to Zenith. The image shows horizon stars at sunset for midpoint of four of the five ceremonies. The fifth ceremony for Tem at Sincatl shows horizon stars for pre-dawn timing when the sacrifice occurred. As you can see, they all align at the flute player complex. In addition to ceremonial timing, several factors allow for Tezcatl Lapoca to be tied to Pleiades. For Oliver, Aztec New Fire, which is tied to Pleiades, represents the Tezcatl Lapoca prototype, lighting the fire after a flood as Pleiades passes overhead. Additionally, the smoking foot of Tezcatl Lapoca relates to the Kishin god Tohil, starting fire by twisting his foot inside a sandal, which is of further interest as the Maya considered to be the Pleiades to be several things, one of which is a sandal. In the creation period, Tezcatl Lapoca transformed into a giant snake. Later in human form, one of his legs can be associated with a Zui Kotl or fire serpent. For Milbreth, the latter is possibly shown in Yucatan artwork with Pleiades as rattle, with snake body showing the distinctive twist to Perseus. Temple remains found by Richard Blanton may reflect the location for Tezcatl Lapoca sacrifice. If so, it is near Cerro de la Estrella which is where the new fire ceremony took place, showing a possible connection to Pleiades. Bale and Hernandez state that Tezcatl Lapoca and Quetzalcoatl sit on thrones on opposite sides of the Milky Way. Quetzalcoatl has ties to the intersection of Milky Way and ecliptic at the Great Rift, which could be considered opposite Tezcatl Lapoca. And as you can see, both are in a sitting position. Now let's look at some of the features of the asterism. The separation of head and body may relate to beheading in Tezcatl Lapoca sacrifice. Stars emanating from head resemble a twinkling flute. Hurricane, a Kishi equivalent, means one-legged and is associated with violent storms. The asterism shows one leg and is overhead at dawn in the middle of hurricane season. Tezcatl Lapoca is associated with virility, creating sexual desire. This may be related to the form of the Perseus constellation with Argol, a variable, part of a large pulsating penis. The W of Cassiopeia could resemble either a lightning bolt associated with storms or a conical cap by closing off one of the ends of the W. Both have associations to Tezcatl Lapoca. Now that concludes the flute player, which I think is well substantiated. If the Hopi flute player is connected to Tezcatl Lapoca, then we might expect his opposite, Quatoco, who is better known by his Zuni name, Knifewing, to compare to Tezcatl Lapoca's opposite, Quetzalcoatl. This comparison is interesting as we do not have a lot of ceremonies. However, we can place both at the intersection of Milky Way and Ecliptic, which will take several steps. First, we'll start in the southwest with the Beast God legend, which states that Knifewing or Eagle Tanager is overhead, Mountain Lion to northeast, Bear to northwest, Badger or Wildcat to southwest, Wolf to southeast, and Mole either at Nader or Horizon. 
Notice in the mural there is no entity at Nader, but the mole could be on horizon. Also, Fuchs states that the mole is the guardian of the underworld, which could correlate either with Nader or horizon. Ray and I once combined on a paper for this. It is from Villard, the Velarde book and shows a journey in the stars. People were traveling along the Milky Way and can go no further and had to detour along the ecliptic. From her description, we see mole at Sipapu or entrance to underworld located at Spica. House the Spider Woman at Libra and Mark of the Turtle at Sagittarius. For our purposes now, the mole is, is of importance. Now, as a side note, you may be wondering why the tribe had to detour along the ecliptic. And as you can see, the gods are the reason why. But back to the problem at hand. With Spike on horizon, as exemplified by the, the circle on the horizon at the left, the asterisms we have identified as humpback eagle and mountain lion are in their beast god positions. Interestingly, this configuration is similar to the first day of the Aztec calendar at sunrise, Maya creation at sunset. However, due to a latitude change, Spica will not be on horizon in Mesoamerica. This configuration is also similar to Hopi emergence. Now you might ask how we know the emergence configuration. Per legend, Sotenango and Masao were first to greet the Hopi as they emerged from the underworld by climbing a tree. If one assumes the tree is the Milky Way and puts Sotenango and Masao on the horizon, then Cygnus is overhead with humpback on Mer Meridian. Here are the actual star configurations for the aforementioned dates. Notice how similar they are. And, and one last thing on the, the beast guide. Here's the membrane spot showing three in a row. It's, possi it's possibly located to the beast guide configuration. If the wolf is to the southeast, then Buotis, the, the fish would be opposite and is in the northeast next to the bear with the war brother at Zenith. Now let's go to the next step, tying Quetzalcoatl to the same intersection. Multiple references tie Quetzalcoatl to various entities or incarnations that include Maze God, Principal Bird Deity, Coco Can, and Itzima, though Chris and others will argue against Itzima. Here we see one of those incarnations, Principal Bird Deity, at intersection of Milky Way and Ecliptic. Quetzalcoatl was mostly celebrated in Chilola. However, we do not have any calendars from that town. The Aztec replaced Quetzalcoatl with Sun God in Festival 15, which shows the asterism setting at sunset and rising at sunrise. Duran mentions a sacrifice on February 2 at midnight, which has the entity rising. In addition, it is overhead at dawn for the Quetzalcoatl light shadow effect at Chichen Itza. The death of Kaplitz in Quetzalcoatl is interesting as he is able to pick the time of his death, which is when the asterism is leaving Lower Meridian. Finally, when the maze god is overhead, the area of the turtle is underneath and connected by the Milky Way, reminiscent of Maya artwork showing the maze god emanating from the turtle. <clears throat> Additional indicators ties the maze god and Quetzalcoatl to the Milky Way, and in particular to the intersection of Milky Way and Ecliptic. The Great Rift or Black Road is pictured by the dark area on the images at one intersection of Milky Way and Ecliptic, and is the last place the hero twins are seen on the search for their father, who is thought to be the Maze God. Venus Quetzalcoatl was reborn at this intersection. The Milky Way is rural tree could relate to the Popo Vol story where the Maze God's head is in a tree. Further Popo Vol characters such as bat and fish are possibly located nearby. Finally, this location would put him opposite Tezcatlipoco in the Milky Way, tying into the Vale and Hernandez legend. The asterism is roughly the same size as Tezcatlipoco, with somewhat similar shape with triangular cap and rounded back and epiphalic, but with two prominent bent legs instead of one. The matching figures add credence to the stories of the two being divine twins and may reflect the name Coato, which can mean either twin or snake. The figure allows for a previous snake aspect, triangular head running down to M13 as the fire snake tail. The conical cap could relate to a conical temple roofs for Quetzalcoatl and perhaps to Maya cranial deformation. The long beak invokes some Quetzalcoatl imagery. 
Finally, the human Quetzalcoatl is overhead at dawn, is during the windy season. Additional indicators tie May's God and Quetzalcoatl to the Milky Way, and in particular to an intersection of Milky Way and ecliptic. The Great Rift or Black Road is pictured by the dark area on the image is at one intersection of the Milky Way and ecliptic, and is the last place the hero twins are seen on the search for their father. Now this concludes Quetzalcoatl, which is not as well substantiated as Tezcatlipoca, but should be given extra weight as it fits in with the Tezcatlipoca data. Okay, now let's compare Hopi ceremonies to Talak and Chalchuitlake. Hopi snake alternates each year with Hopi flute. If we follow a process similar to the flute, there are 11 possible constellations that could possibly be involved, plus Cassiopeia and Perseus, which makes nine. Of these, Eridanus is most likely as his upper meridian for the upper world ceremony and lower meridian for the lower. Hopi snake antelope ceremony reflects tales of a snake maiden who could transform to human and had the ability to bring rain, marrying a Hopi culture hero named Tayo who developed snake characteristics in the snake's skin. Their first set of children were snakes whom the village has to leave the village. The ability to transform to other animals is sometimes associated with when the world was soft and mud heads. This is of further interest as the figure in the image has been identified as a mud head. It is worth noting that due to shared ceremonial timing, some feel that Talak and Chalchowitlake may be two manifestations of what was once a single entity. Iran describes Talak as having a body of a man with a serpent face and fangs. Hopi snake youth Tayo can be described as part snake and part man. Goggle eyes are seen in both mud heads and Talak. Hopi snake maiden is associated with rain, serpents, and birth. Chalchuitlake may wear a serpent-shaped headdress and nose ornament. She's associated with rivers, which in turn have an association with snakes, is patron of the day sign Kotol, which means serpent, and associated with birth. The water serpent of the Pueblos may or not may not be tied to Tayo and snake maiden. However, it is associated with rain, lightning, springs, underground water, floods, earthquakes, and some tales of child sacrifice. All these traits are associated with Talak and Chalchowitlake. Iran shows a snake with a cloud on its head for the 13th festival honoring the Talakis, which is at the end of the rainy season. In Hopi tales, the great snake that bears the cloud on its head guarded the snake kiva where Tayo and Snake Maiden meet. While the snake with the cloud on its head may or may not tie to Arantanus, it does at least show another connection to Mesoamerica. The right side shows Talak and Chalchuitlake festivals. If we start looking for patterns, you can see that they include the first four ceremonies, which suggest a long constellation. Festivals 6 and 13 are not on meridian or horizon at sunset, which initially caused concern. However, they are opposite 3 and 16, fitting in with the concept that Aztec believed the underworld is opposite the upper world. In Festival 16, Iridanus emanates from and hovers over a large volcanic range which holds Mount Talak and shines for Chalchowitlake. Please note that the horizon line pictured in the images for illustrative purposes only and not exact. Lastly, the main Talak ceremony was held on Mount Talak with the sacrifice shortly after dawn when Iridanus is rising. Moving along, there are several ceremonies that suggest the death god and flute player are near each other. Both are tied to Hopi flute and Hopi emergence. Both are tied to new fire. During the July-August Aztec flute player celebration, Duran pictures the death god overhead. Maya revolt with Cassiopeia, Perseus, and Pleiades overhead as calendar date of 5 semi 19 Zul, signifying death and the end. The Hopi say that those who have seen the death god see him on the horizon, possibly suggesting a small entity made bigger by refraction. Using Hopi qualifiers of death god being a red-headed man, always dressed in black, and evidence he is near Perseus, a possible death god location could include the California Nebula at head. 
And if you look at it, you see a black shape here, kind of in a squatting position, similar to the death god images. Now, running out of time here, so I'll keep this one short. Colic hue and aspects have ceremonial timing that allow for a legal Virgo asterism with each aspect showing separate stellar positions, such as rising setting or meridian meridian. As with Tezcat Lapoca, decapitation sacrifices could pertain to the space between the two asterisms. Tosi can be shown with cotton spindles in her hair, which could pertain to what modern astronomers call scales in Libra. Further, her weaving abilities could compare to Velarde's spider woman at Libra. Some obs observations. One intersection of Milky Way and ecliptic is associated with rebirth, rejuvenation, springtime, Quetzalcoatl and Maze God. The other association, the other intersection associated with death, the fall, Tezcatlipoca, and the turtle. Upper world ceremonies for main events appear tied to horizon or meridian positions at sunset. Lesser events held pre-dawn or at midnight reflect stellar locations at that time. Underworld ceremonies can be opposite upper world ceremonies, and when flipped 180 degrees would be on horizon or a meridian. With the exception of death god, all shown here today travel through or within a few degrees of either zenith or nadir. And that is the end. Again, if anybody would like a copy of the PowerPoint with notes, give me a yell and I'll send it out. And if anybody would like to use any of the joints, please feel free to do so. Well, that was great, Mark. Thank you very much. Well worth the wait. Were, uh, were a lot of those uh, horizon diagrams, were they, were they yours? Um, no, no, I, ha I have a friend that's the artist. Well, that's, that's great. Yeah, they, they add, add quite a bit to the show. Now, well, when I first started at the society, I was, gosh, 20 years ago, I was dearly, you know, I had the the images that overlaid on the Pueblo constellations, and I was dearly hoping that somebody would take what I found and, and apply it to Mesoamerica, because really Mesoamerica is a hard, if you look at it, it can be pretty complex for most people. But if you just use the ceremonies and, and the uh, attributes of the gods, it becomes much simpler. Um, so I am hoping that some of you guys in the future might be able to take this to another step. And what you would need probably is more data on the ceremonies. Um, you know, I, I just pretty much limited to the books I showed you. But um, there it is, guys. Hope you can take it a step further. Yeah, I like it. Um, and as you know, we we differ on some we differ on some some minor points. But one thing I'd, I would like to point out, though is the turtle. The turtle, I mean, there's a lot of uh, disagreement when it comes to Maya constellations, and particularly the uh, zoomorphic constellations of the Paris Codex. But the one thing that I think everybody agrees upon is that the turtle is um, an asterism that's made up of a lot of the stars of Orion. Well, let, let me interrupt you here. Do, do you know sure. where that? Do you know where that story started? Kiragua. No, it started with Linda Shield, and well, she, she she she, she came up with that she came up with that conclusion because it was on the horizon on a certain date. Well, if you look at Origa, it is very close to horizon, Ryan. It is on the on the horizon at the same date, so. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that Linda was right, although she also said it could be Gemini, which is on the horizon too. Well, and, Linda, Linda was partially right. The, what you're talking about is um, she used a date from Lounsbury off of the murals of Bonapac, you know, right? So we have the four cartouches in Bonapac above the battle scene, and uh, Lounsbury read it, and, and from that, she surmised that the what they call the copulating peccaries was Gemini, and the, the turtle was Orion, and she misidentified two other 
cartouches as Jupiter and Saturn or Mars and Saturn, I forget, I forget which one. But if you do run, you know, if you do run the same process with the corrected date, which uh, Miller and Simon Martin published a couple of years later, uh, Gemini and Orion are, are still there. And, well, and, so, so would Arigua be. Um, okay. And and one more one more point to point out is we have all these correlations between the southwest and down there, but with the Hopi Orion is its own entity. Mm -hmm. With with the Tiwa Orion is its own entity, which, which then, is not a great point. And then somehow we get down to Mesoamerica and it's divided into several things, which may be true. I mean, it could be oh. that there are differences in the areas. And, and you're absolutely right. So when we when we talk about Maya constellations, what we have is we have uh, the Paris Codex from basically from Chichen Itza and the Yucatan, and then we have this uh, creation text from Kiragua. But there's really no solid evidence that the Maya constellations of Chichen Itza were the same in Paul. Uh, I was in Palenque are or to call or, you know, Piedras Negras. We only know what they were in Chichen Itza, but we, we do have a good feel uh, from several lines of evidence that that turtle um, was there because in your Madrid picture that you showed, uh, Kiragua creation text talks about um, how the gods make <laughs> And they placed they placed the um, the, the stones the uh, jaguar throne stone and the, you know the snake throne stone they placed these three stones of creation which were like the hearth at the at the place of creation which your one slide was absolutely right there is one end of the uh, intersection of the Milky Way and the eclipse and the other side which is the dark spot you know where um, your, the great rift the great rift right that is that is the dark road oh, so the black the, road yeah yeah so th that dichotomy is real but the but the three hearthstones with the turtles at least in eastern maya culture was a creation uh, uh six sky place so, and just because that's true, that doesn't mean that that follows through through to the Aztecs, you know, to the American Southwest. That's true for the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, that's the only thing, yeah. you know. Yeah, many, they're, they're all in the same area there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's yeah, no guarantees on that one. Yeah, but but I but I loved it. Can I ask a quick question? This is Rick. Thanks, thanks, Mark. It's oh, you're welcome. Love to hear from you again. This is really sort of super cool. I love actually that it was uh, travel through memory lane. I think is when we were doing those little drawings and over. Yes, yes. Was probably must be fifteen years ago or, or more. I don't know. In a long time. Um, I'm just curious about. I don't know a lot of. I'm just. I'm an amateur at sort of understanding. You know where the world is on on constellations and 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 cultures and things like that. But I, um, I, I just. I want to ask a question about the ecliptic. The, the ecliptic is. I mean, the Milky Way and the ecliptic are two uh, manifest themselves in completely different ways. And if you aren't a little bit savvy about motion of planets you would never know where the ecliptic is. So, so you're talking about these sort of this geography where they cross or they're, you know, things are next to each other. Um, how, uh, what do you see that is an ecliptic uh, unless you understand the, the constellations of the zodiac or the movement of the planets? Am I, am I wrong or am I just using the wrong reference? I'm not following you here. Well, I, I, can, do, I can answer for you, Mark at least from a Mesoamerican point of view. And, and that was paramount of importance, Rick. Every time you see a Maya image with what they call a sky band, and, and they're all over Maya art. And if you see a sky band, that's automatically uh, a pointer that you're looking at a celestial image. And the sky band essentially is the intersection of the ecliptic and the Milky Way. 
but there is no, um, I mean, uh, I guess, again, what, what visually do you see as the ecliptic as a band? What well, can be observed? Uh, for the Maya, apart from 13 zodiacal constellations, uh, certainly the, the motion of the planets. You know, they tracked um, Venus especially, but they also tracked Mars and Jupiter, and to a lesser extent, Saturn. So they were well uh, aware of the path of the planets across the sky. And <clears throat> when they came in contact with the, with the Milky Way, and I'm sure it was the same for, for the Tela. Okay. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure how the Tewa got it, but but I do know that they did get it because of Velarde's description. Um, and we, we can be pretty sure she was accurate on that because she got tossed out of her tribe for, for saying that. Mm. Giving away the ecliptic? <laughs> yes, of all things. I just, I just I, you know, I mean, the two manifestations are just completely different. I mean, I can get that anybody can see a trail of the Milky Way, right? And that's that that, that would figure prominently, you know, but um, to but the the a combination of that with an intersection with the ecliptic has to be inferred, not observed, right? That that is something that you have to know is there just by virtue of the movement of planets, not an observable object mm -hmm. and so and just i'm just that's what i was just curious about you're using you're using the two together there's an intersection of this and this it's like an an, an intersection of an orange and um, a breath of air you know i mean it's like they're they're two different things well you can you can watch the path of the moon throughout one evening and pretty much trace the ecliptic uh, you know, if, if these guys did I, that I, night after I'm not, night. I'm, yeah, I'm not disagreeing with with that. Yeah. It is, if there's ways to sort of know this, but it's uh, it's just it. it I'm just I'm just it, mm -hmm. to hear the two shared as part of a phenomenon is a little. It's just a little bit strange. Yeah, it's 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 very real that that's an integral part of the Maya creation story. And it's really, really interesting to see its manifestation in the American Southwest. Now, I can recall in some of my more intimate talks with, with um, the Tiwa, now one of the reasons that they were able to adopt um, Christ into the Pantheon was that they too had a God that was overhead on a cross at Easter, and the cross was the ecliptic in the Milky Way. The same God was rising at Christmas time. Um, so anyway, this, this, they they did they did did know about that intersection. May I ask you, Mark, a question? And actually, the whole panel, and I'm especially including uh, in on this, Greg. Um, so uh, I, I wish I could share. My, I'm having problems with my camera right now, but it, but um, so we uh, found it and really intriguing art. Most of the archaeology I deal with is rock art relating to the Fremont Indians in Utah, the Fremont people of Utah, Fremont Complex. And uh, so um, anyway, there's this stone disc that has 19 etchings on the top. It has uh, 13 what look like full moons, and then it has a crescent you know, uh, what looked like a waxing and waning crescent and a, a full circle in the middle. Obviously, you're, you're thinking, um, you know, ma major lunar standstill uh, and with the 19 etchings across the top. And um, so I, I just was just wondering if anyone's come across an artifact that looks anything like that. It's about the size of a half dollar. There are similar ones. I, someone sent me a picture of one from uh, Mesa Verde. And the reason that I'm especially listening, Mark, is because it's very likely the people who, who occupied Mesa Verde in the, the later years were um, Tewa speaking. Um, and we're trying to figure out what language some of the Fremont people spoke. Um, so anyway, I, I really enjoyed the presentation, but I just, and any comments anyone has, especially 
you, Mark, or you, Greg, because uh, I'm familiar with you know Greg's work at Chimney Rock and um, you know and Malville's work there. Any comments anyone has? I'd love. My, to my work was mostly at Mesa Verde Sun Temple. Um, and yeah, I'm not familiar with any kind of artifact like of that nature that you you've described. Yeah. Um, there are the pictographs in um, the tower. Yeah. That, uh, you know, there were some uh, modifications, historic modifications made to those that may change the association with the number counts there. Um, so I, I don't know that I could really contribute to that part of this discussion. Yeah. It has very little to do with the stars, Mark and Greg and everyone else. It's just, um, what, what, Mark, what you just showed suggests that there's a, a, a deep knowledge of, uh, of the constellations, the way we would think of the way the Greeks and Romans and Mesopotamians had every single, practically every single star uh, associated with a, a star figure, a constellation. Yes, this is true. And I, I suspect that it goes beyond to the Southwest. Um, there are um, the humpbacked images all the way up at the Great Lakes. Wow. The Plain Indians had a, a white buffalo, and I sometimes we heard the uh, Tiva buffalo ceremonies called white buffalo. Um, so I, I suspect it extends, not all of it, but some of it extends farther out. Mark, I was uh, kind of curious if uh, since you gave your presentation in um, Flagstaff in 2019, um, have you been able to maybe get any more input or uh, solicit any input from the descending communities, Hopis, about your uh, thoughts on the, the, the Hopi constellations you described? No, no, I have not. Um... No, not, nothing since then. But I did make make some good contacts then. Oh, good. God, I'm glad you did. And Mark, uh, yes. when you overlaid uh, some of the, uh, I think, pictographs over the constellations, you made some notes that um, the slight alterations. I was just curious what that was. It just kind of like stretching them or, or you know, flattening yeah, them? Yeah, so or... Rick did that, and he was able to, to manipulate those things a little bit, you know, give one a little more curve or expand one here on the side. Or... Shorten the snake a little bit for Iridanus. Um, but okay. it, we, we, we felt comfortable doing that um, um, uh, mostly because uh, it, it really is, even if we understand sort of the way constellations are manifest in sort of the Greco Roman and Eastern Mediterranean cultures, it's just there's no, there's no special fit. Uh, you know, it's not right. an outline, it's an not answer, a, yeah. Dots. It's not a, you know, it, it's not a whatever. So we were really trying to just sort of just just allow the drawing to uh, essentially, uh, you know, follow the curves and things of the shape and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Rick. With, yeah. with you're talking about special fit. As you know, as Westerners, we we've become so used to our constellations. You know, when we look at Orion, just seeing the line drawings. The monitor, modern yes. astronomers have done. Okay. That's that's not how the indigenous cultures looked at them. So not even how the Greeks drew them. No. You know, that's a, a very modern thing, and it's helpful when we're looking at, at the sky and sky charts at it. You know, indigenous astronomies that we try to, you know, cast off that constellation line drawing mentality. You know, because. There's a lot of stars there that fit, you know, in these images that are, you know, that we, we need to take into account, I think, with the whole thing. Yeah, and the two other comments there is, and I think uh, Mark mentioned it, is that, you know, we also have to throw away the boundaries, right? Just, mm -hmm. just somebody says a turtle is in Orion. That doesn't necessarily right. mean. Right, exactly. 
same star. Sure. So, so we, yeah. we got to toss that away. But also, um, I made this discovery myself, or at least I think I did, is um, I did had an experience where I saw the Big Bear, Ursa Major, but it was completely unlike anything anybody draws. It was a different orientation. It was facing a different way. Its legs were in a different position. And, uh, and the, the only reason I saw that or that manifests itself to me is because it was exceptionally dark skies. And there's a significant amount of texture in the sky that we don't see at all. It's just gone. So there is a, there's that the dark spaces, and you know just sort of faint clusters of light and things like that that intersperse with all of our constellations that are gone to us. They're lost, and we don't see them anymore. Um, but uh, but of course, ancients would have and and uh, would have access to a sky uh, that has a lot more layers and texture to it than we do. And so, yeah. so really, but we're back to that point when Mark and I were kind of trying to do this, yeah. it wasn't to try to trick the drawings right. into. Oh yeah, I, 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 it was more like just to sort of say this is a this and you could also imagine that if it you know from uh, from from like the members you know pottery that he was dealing with, uh, any given next ten artists that used the same subject would have it in a in a completely different um, configuration. I, would absolutely. Be and that's, that's, that's part of where the argument comes in with the Maya, because some people think the snake is this, other people think it's that. Uh, but the answer is they saw snakes all over the place. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. And just you know, just like we look at the you know Ursa Major, and you know we call it a bear, and we call it a dipper, and we call it a wheelbarrow, and we call it a plow. And, you know, and, and that's just in this one, you know, culture. We have five or six names for this one constellation, so you know, yeah, we can't, right, we can't put our fingers on the scale and say, you know, this is where the, with this is where the snake is, this is where the turtle is, without being very, very specific. I I think that's right, and really, I, Mark, I applaud you for staying with us, for, and I, I I was a little bit tickled by your comment where. You would hope somebody would pick this up and like take it like to the to the <laughs> or something like that. And you're absolutely right. But this is such a hard thing to, uh, you know, it's it's not like you're going to mush something around a little bit and then suddenly it's going to start blinking and say, you got it. <laughs> you, you, you win. Right. I mean, it really is. You just have to really just kind of just layer and layer and layer on um, some of the research you've been doing and kind of, you know, kind of you know, test and try and all that stuff. And I, I, I guess you have to be um, one of my, my favorite professors used to say, you have to be comfortable with ambiguity. <laughs> and, uh, there is, there's a little bit of that in, uh, in, in what you're doing. And, and oh, we yes. <clears throat> well, you know, it's, it's not all that different than the job I do every day in appraisals. It's like, there's nothing exact. You, you, you're starting out in what kind of fits and, and you end up with the best opinion. Um, you, you draw data from a bunch of different sources, but, but it's not exact. Exactly right. Yeah, after years of just trading emails and, and bits and pieces, I'm, I'm tickled to see the whole thing. <laughs> well, that's true. Poor, poor Chris. I, I would try to describe this stuff to him, but he never saw any of this, and uh, it was a little harder. Right. We, we always did this in three-minute or five-minute bite-sized pieces. But, and you know, back from those class days, one of the things I, 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 one of the questions I remember most, and I'll send it out to all of you, but what was more important to, 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 the, to the natives? Was, was it the sun or was it the stars? And, and there's no right or wrong answer, but, but give that some thought over the next week. You know, there's, I'll, I, I'm going to answer it in a, in a different way, is that um, everything uh, is against a, a background of a star field, right? And we that ambiguity we have to get used to is we, you know, Westerners have positioned all those stars exactly where they are and can tell you exactly how bright they are and all that stuff. But that didn't matter or doesn't mean anything to others. And so a star field is just that. It's a you know, it's a, it's a mysterious, uh, you know, phenomenon of dots of light that are in the background, and uh, all of our stories and mythologies and stuff can sort of like take place in that in that place. Um, 
So um, I think I think the fact that there's a night sky is very important. And I think the fact that, that people are sort of watching the sun, the moon and doing all that kind of stuff is, is um, also, you know, is another aspect of how we you know, kind of come to know our environment and come to know our cycles and all that kind of stuff. So I, I often um, will look at an accurate star field and then uh, we've all done it, right? You watch a movie, right? And then some Hollywood artist does just, you know, there's a starry sky behind that seat. And uh, you know, it's not a real starry sky. I mean, it's not the starry sky. It's just a, a distribution of stars that some artist has driven. And that means something, right? Because now there's this peaceful cabin underneath the star field sky. It, it doesn't have to be the accurate placement of all the stars. It's, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a star field. And so, so I think we also have to just accept that a lot of people just sort of operate it under, you know, under a night sky that's absolutely beautiful and dazzling and um, sort of represents what it represents in and of itself. Are you uh, planning on updating your book, Mark? Well, there's a few errors in that one, but I, I don't know if that'll update, update it. I, I do got a paper coming out. Um, it's to be next winter now with with uh, Steve, okay, and another paper with uh, with a journal over in Europe, which is from the uh, Brazil conference. But it's hard to squeeze all of this into to twenty small pages. So, um, yeah, and and the the argument doesn't really carry as much weight when you only use part of this. So we'll see how it goes. So that's why I was asking. I think when it all together it. It makes a story. I think if you just had a piece of it, it'd be people say, well, maybe, you know, it's hard to. Hard well, to well, you're right. It is. Maybe that'd be a good project for the, for the society. We could all get together and do a book. And our free time, Greg? No. no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> up. Mark, can I ask another question about the paper? We sure. read, we read the paper about the table. And you referenced, um, let me see, there's an archaeologist that I hadn't known. Uh, now I can't remember his name. It just isn't popping out. But of oh, uh, Harrington. Harrington, the 1920s. And it was intriguing to me that you, you made specific note that he sat with people in 1929 in the night sky and talked about sort of stars and constellations and all that stuff. Um, I, I think that's pretty amazing. I just never really realized yes. And uh, anyway, so that, you know, that's, but has anybody else done that? I mean, is that, does that come up every once in a while in anybody's experience? No, not that I know of. No, but getting back to Harrington, he had, um, there were some interesting comments going through his book. First of all, you know, he would try to get them to identify Perseus and Cassiopeia, and they would not do it. And he, and he just said they have no name for it. They don't don't recognize it for some reason. But I, my guess is that it was such a major god they didn't want to tell him. Now they told him a bunch of little gods. I mean, a bunch of little constellations. But when I got to that one, they didn't. He also, in one of his other papers, had this stick game what, what that that they would play, and they would. Um, one of them was uh, you would draw Cassiopeia. And if it was on, if it was flat, it would mean clouds. But if it was upright, it would mean thunder. But it was the Cassiopeia sign, the W. Um, but he never got he never got them to admit there was a, a constellation for the Cassiopeia. Interesting. Anyway, that's it's the first time I've ever heard of um, you know kind of somebody. Oh, his book is. It's a big book. And, and he, he has a lot of, um, he was more into the language than anything. And he would describe, um, you know, creeks and rivers and the, and the names, the native names for him. And uh, he was pretty good with the language. Yeah, I, I recently was reading his work actually last weekend, um, Mark, and he is quite the linguist. You yes. Know, was quite the linguist. And that's what his, I think that's what his, his mastery was. And um, but he really tried to to figure out which star figures matched up um, when he was talking to uh, Tewa speakers. And 
Um, do you have any comments on the, the, the Moiety system, you know, where they had like the summer and winter systems? I, I know that there's a pretty big exchange of uh, information, of celestial information between the, the, uh, the winter Moiety and the summer Moiety, uh, where the, the, uh, the sky watching priests that time the ceremonies um, get together and they share a lot of input. Um, a lot of it has to do what we would call uh, celestial divination. Um, you know, is is the moon got a reddish tint to it? Is there a white clouds around the moon and stuff like that? Hmm. Yeah. No, I, I don't know anything anything on that side of it. Well, John, you, you seem to have a wealth of information, too. I'm glad you're, you're part of the group. Thank you. We, um, so we did a, an article. We thought, like I said, I, I wish I could share my screen. I, I could show this artifact to you and you'd be like, oh, my gosh, that's a that shows, you know, the, the, the probably information can it, the number 19, the number 13 and crescent. What looks like two crescent moons and a full moon. And uh, it, it's just intriguing because we thought this was a unique artifact and it doesn't appear to be. Um, and, there's, there's another one like that at the museum, Greg, at Mesa Verde. Um, and- uh, Not familiar uh, with that, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll share it with you. No, I'll share it with you and you can- Yeah, you can, go ahead and uh, if you could email that to me. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Can you share your screen? I mean- I, I'll give it a shot, let me, let me try. Uh, um, should be able to. So let me just try. And I'm trying to get on my, uh, I'm not getting it. I'm trying to get my, uh, let me just see if I can share anything. There it goes. Okay. So let me, let me see if I can get this artifact here. Hang on one second. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I messed up. Oops, sorry. Hang on. Let me. Let's try to get this thing out of the way. Okay, so I'll open up the. Uh, I'm going to try to open up this. We uh, hang on a second. I'm just trying to pull it up. Sorry, I'm sorry, everybody. No sorry. Hold on. Um, so let me just try to get it there. And um, can anyone see that artifact? No, you uh, stop sharing your screen. Okay. You gotta share uh, screen again. Yeah, sorry. Let me let me try that again. Sorry. Um, let me go back to my sharing my screen. Share screen. Okay, so there it is. Okay, share. Okay, that that's the artifact. Okay. Oh. So that gets your attention. Um, and the reason it, it does is, you know, the, the Fremont are ancestral Puebloan. They're, they're, you know, culturally, the, the Hopi identify them as their ancestors. The, the mitochondrial DNA connects them to the, um, the occupants at Jemez Pueblo. Um, but you can see there's 19 notches across the top. There's 13 circles, you know, uh, what, I'm calling them full moons, just follow along with me. Um, there's what look to be two crescents and then a central hole. And um, so, so they're, you know, they're, they're Pueblo and so they're, key, they're tracking time. And if the, a lot of the Western, I'm mostly going off of Michael Zielik's work here, but um, the Western Pueblos reckoned uh, 13 moons Many of them reckon 13 moons, presumably because there's the beginning of a 13th lunation. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's about the size, a little bit bigger than the half dollar, about four centimeters across. Um, we thought it was a unique artifact. We recently published it in January and um, you know that the Russian journal Archaeoastronomy and Ancient Technologies. Um, and so, uh, Anyway, we, we're finding out that the, the, get, getting back to um, Harrington, so he's got 
Matilda Cox Stevenson's papers. Um, so, uh, so an un unpublished papers. And she, here's what she, I'll just read it. So this is coming out of Zealot. But so Matilda Cox Stevenson's was, was uh, with K with speaking people. And she writes um, that uh, the sun and ice rain priest keep a tally of their observations by cutting the edges of the stone discs with stone knives. The disc of the moon has a moon face painted on in yellow. Well, this isn't a moon face, but it's got similarities in the sense of the crescents and, you know, central hole. A new disc is made each year and the old one deposited in, in the room with the Tsekin, uh, which is a, uh, it's a, the fructif fructification fetish, the fertility fetish. Uh, she says that the Tewa have four seasons, summer, autumn, winter, and spring, uh, divided into a total of 12 months. So it's hard to get a hold of that because it's in the Smithsonian and they're not exactly, there's a lot of Harrington papers. So anyway, um, so I, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, just wanted to share that with you. And you see why I was very interested in, um, in Mark's presentation. Hey, John, where does, where does the artifact exist? Fremont Indian State Park. Yeah, and that's in, it's like uh, central, you know, the, the Fremont, basically the Anas, which I'm going, I mean, you know, they're all ancestral Pueblo now, but what used to be the Anasazi basically inhabits Southern Utah up until about the, the, um, the you know, the Colorado River. And then north of the Colorado, you have which, what gets called the Fremont complex or the Fremont people, but they're, but they're surely speaking multiple languages uh, and, and living very diverse lifestyles. They never really get past Pueblo one um, regarding their social structure. There are some above ground structures, rectilinear houses, above ground stru structures that look like Pueblo one, um, but everything else is pit house villages. They don't seem to have kivas, but they do seem to have ceremonial structures. But by the way, the reason that artifact is so interesting, and I'm keep drawing going back to you, Greg, is because that artifact, there was a lot of uh, turquoise found in the same, they call it Pit House 57. And uh, it had a lot of turquoise that was uh, coming up on trade routes where Chaco and the Hocom get their uh, their turquoise. And so I'm thinking like Zodiac Ridge and the major lunar stand still mark there. I'm thinking of Chaco and you know the you know the the Sun Dagger, which also appears to mark the the uh, you know the major lunar stand still and the 19 grooves in that circle. The number 19 keeps showing up. You see it in some of the Mimbre pots. You see rabbits with 19 uh, markings on them. Uh, again possibly signifying the 19 solar years it would take to mark the 18.61 year major lunar standstill. Mm -hmm. And so, so I found what you just presented, Mark, very reassuring because it, it implies that the, um, you know, that the Tewa speaking people knew a heck of a lot about astronomy. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And unfortunately I'm not familiar with the, uh, you know, any artifacts at Mesa Verde that have that appearance. So I'm not sure which ones you, you're, were, you're referring to. I can share my screen again and show it to you if you like. So, <laughs> okay. You want to do that again? I, I can do it again if you like. So, sure. Uh, Tell me the one from Mesa Verde. I might recognize it. But yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me try that one. Let me, let me try to find it. Uh, okay. Um, you're, you're one for drama, aren't you? <laughs> So um, you guys want to try to get this. Um... No, that is fascinating. I'm just and you said that was the other one that you said that was from uh, the Fremont Museum is. Um, there you go. I'm going to share it right now. That's the one from Mesa Verde. No, oh, I see. So that has 30 notches in it. Again, another. Oh, okay, it's in a, it's in a, okay, yeah, I hadn't even really noticed it before because it's in the, the jewelry case. That's uh, what they have as a pendant. Yes, and, and we call the one at Fremont Indian State Park, Greg, we call that one, uh, and, and Mark and everyone else, 
uh, the the uh, we call it the 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 moonstone, the Fremont pendant moonstone, or something to that effect. Um, so uh, yeah, how, how, what is the size? Are 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 they the same size or they're, they're roughly the same size? Again, this one we we thought we had a unique artifact, and so there's something in Utah called the Utah Cultural Astronomy Project. So I'm one of the I'm kind of the main archaeologist, and we're just a, a, a loose uh, enclave of scholars who, when we find something we think has some kind of uh, uh, indigenous astronomical knowledge embedded within it, we try to pursue it. Um, so that's where all this came from. And, um, and ironically, this is going to sound so hysterical, but I also have a K through 12 teaching license. So I have a little archaeology club and I get all these middle school age kids to go out and stand at a lot of these sites and take photographs at solstices and equinoxes and various other points. So, <laughs> so it may sound boring, but if you're 12, it's the last word in entertainment, you know. So, um, so anyway, I'll, I'll stop sharing. But, uh, but yeah, again, okay. that's, that's what I wanted to share with you folks. And uh, I, I somehow updated my computer and it did something where it's not automatically turning on my video. So I apologize for that. But, um, Sometimes you got to go uh, to put, look at uh, for the camera in your uh, settings and have to turn it on internally. So, yeah, and that's probably what I'm going to have to do. But because I just updated my computer and that, that's probably oh, what happened. I don't know. It. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, I, I just. I love all of your work. I deeply admire so so many of you. Um, and so anyway, uh, I look forward to future, you know, communications and collaborations. Yeah, look forward okay. to maybe getting some your have your group attend our meetings more or become members too. So that would be fun. Maybe we could interact more. That would be fantastic. Be fantastic. And uh, Mark, if you could uh, send me a copy of the uh, PowerPoint Please. presentation, uh, I'll be glad a lot to of people have been asking for a copy of it, and I can just turn it a PDF and post it on our website. Oh, oh, excellent, excellent. Will, you be, gonna, able, will I, you be able to get the notes to it also? Pardon? Will you be able to get the notes with the PDF? Just send me the presentation with the, uh, I assume the notes are embedded in it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I'll That's excellent. Look to see how I could do it. Yeah. That that would be better than, than writing a, a book because you got everything right there. So <laughs> that'd be wonderful, Greg. Thanks. But, but yep. I also want to plug uh, the SCOS member survey. We've had uh, two people submit. Mark, mm -hmm. thank you calling you out <laughs> um and uh so if you can fill that out that would be very helpful thank you yes please did want to say welcome back to david and uh looks like uh next time we'll have to get the it's uh mountain daylight time now <laughs> yeah i screwed that up <laughs> that's why i came in at the end uh. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I'm also very interested in any of of the recording uh, of the presentations. Oh yeah, I, yeah. This all, this is on my list. It's I've got quite a few recordings to get uh, caught up on editing and getting posted up on the YouTube channel. But so just uh, pay attention, and it'll it'll get up there eventually. <laughs> Great, thank you. Let's see. Anybody have anything else? No, that was fantastic. Do we have a date, Chris, for the next one, uh, April? Yeah, I think the next one is. Uh, I'll get the date out. Okay. Uh, date out to you. I uh, I think we're gonna have David talk about the work of uh, Dell. Yeah, that would be great. I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, uh, just need to. We just nail him. Need to nail him down on, on that. Okay, perfect. Get a firm commitment. Then May, I might do uh, those two papers that I I sent you, uh, William Romains, and those couple pages from Magley. Okay. On doing the uh, the 
using Google Earth for archaeoastronomy. Yeah, and I should we should rope Rick into this because I think it'll um those two papers would be a perfect segue for a, like kind of a little <laughs> Right. Um, I'd like to do. I'd like to do two sites or a, a couple sites that would fit in with uh, Greg and the the society's general cultural landscape study. So, uh, so that we're, we're not what we're doing is not you know actually Escalante, but maybe you know something related, something close by that we can just offer a little bit more insight to the larger landscape <laughs> since we can do it from you know since we can do it from google earth so oh okay yeah oh Maybe. you gotta have sites that you can see from google earth <laughs> yep lowry maybe that'd be interesting yeah. and i'll shoot you i'll shoot you an email greg and we can maybe work work that out just get a, a handful you know, that we, and you know, we could probably even include Escalante and do it as a, you know, since we've already have the ground data, this would be a, a nice test. Yeah, I, I was thinking that actually, I mean, that would be perfect. Because I did, uh, when I did our presentation in CCPA, I did go into Google Earth and have started a cultural landscape survey uh, database, shall we say, with sites and you know sight lines and prominent landscape features and something that i can probably share through our google drive yeah so these papers these papers will talk about um collecting azimuths and horizon elevations and of course latitude and longitude built in there so we can calculate declinations and uh no you know, anything we can do with escalani would be great yeah I'd love to I'd love to see it because I'm just I'm going to have to revisit all that stuff we did uh, whenever that was about half a year ago. But. Nope, last May. Huh? We should get it done before this coming May because we're going to do it again. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> going to come out and do Wallace Pueblo. I have That's it on my calendar. Exciting opportunity. Well, great. Well, if there's nothing else, um, thank you all. Um, thank Kathy, you. Hope to see you guys uh, next time, especially Mark. Thank you. It was great. Yes, Mark. Thanks for your work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I was perusing the, uh, the presentation at a slower pace. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, Thanks all. I'll thank see you, you guys next week. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.